especially if you take the position like I do, that abortion should be protected until birth. Is it, I don't know if they say that it's the science that shows this or it's just kind of, they kind of say it like it's a generally known obvious fact that we were, it's always worded, we're designed, we're designed, we're biologically designed to reproduce. That's our, we have that purpose that's, that's kind of, that's what it's for, that's its function. A lot of people will give you pushback. It's not from my Christian view, it's from my view on biology and science that this is what this, this is for. I mean, it's a it's a rationalization usually, I think, that uh, for their religious viewpoint, because there are a lot of other biological capacities that we have that they would never say you have an obligation to exercise like I could kill you using my bare hands. It's a function of my hands to grab things. So uh, that doesn't mean that it's that I have a duty to to go out and use them to do that. But it's certainly true that reproduction is a fact. It's certainly true that certain biological organs are there because they have the function of contributing to reproduction. We are not deterministic beings who have no choice about how we use our different capacities. We are volitional beings who can choose to exercise them or not. It's only if you think of human beings as animals who don't have this kind of choice, uh, where it makes sense to say, oh, this is what you have the function to do. No, I can, I can choose to use my body as I like, and we need to have a standard for deciding what's a good and bad way to use it. But the standard is my life and happiness, uh, not uh, somebody else's life and happiness. And that's a much broader conversation. But um, they're not even so much concerned about the other person's life and happiness. I think the main thing that I have a question for is, is you know, government's role is to protect life, obviously, correct? So what's the difference between maybe a one day old baby and a baby in the womb? Yeah. So this is a this is a question that often that often comes up, especially if you take the position like I do, that that abortion should be protected until birth. The question is looking for a bright line which we talked about a bit already. It's looking for a kind of magical bright line where uh, rights suddenly magically begin. First of all, it's it's a mistake to look for that kind of line. It, the idea that that's how moral decisions are made, looking for lines that have already been drawn for us by nature or what's actually in their view by God is a mistake, that there aren't, there aren't any such lines for us. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's all arbitrary. There are there are facts that we can observe about the the biggest and most important similarities and differences in the world. Something like birth is a really big line. It's a process that I mean can sometimes take hours. When exactly does the child count as being born? It's not a obvious instant where a bell rings and then you know. Once birth has happened, it's the biggest difference that it can possibly, that's the biggest difference that you can possibly make for the relationship between the child and the mother. When the child was in the womb, it was, by that fact, a necessary burden on her existence that she might choose to accept if she really wants to have a child. But if she doesn't want the child, then there's all kinds of ways in which it can it can threaten her happiness. Uh, I mean, it can threaten her life. I mean, it's obviously also going to be a threat to her, just to her her body. And you can you can diminish that, and you can say, oh well, that's just a mild inconvenience that she should be willing to to suffer through. Well, but it's only worth suffering through if it actually achieves something for her life that she wants. Why should she sacrifice any of these things about her body? or her happiness if she doesn't actually want the child? Why does she have this duty to raise a child that she doesn't want, especially if there's not been a case established for why the child has any rights to begin with before birth? Birth is what makes the difference because once she's had the child, uh, the child can go its separate way. It's it's not a threat or a burden to her anymore. She can give she can give it up to for adoption and there's there's no duty that she has even then. Uh, to raise the child if she decides that it's that it's not what she wants and she wants to go through a legal process of, of giving it up for adoption. It's when the, when the two beings are independent of each other, phys- physically and physiologically, that's the kind of situation that gives rise to the need for the concept of rights in the first place. But I'll say one more thing about the the day, the hour before versus the hour after question. What this kind of question usually is 
motivated by, like I said before, is this kind of expectation of a bright line. But there's a there's a fallacy involved in this kind of question. It's what philosophers sometimes call the fallacy of the argument from the beard. Uh, goes a little something like this. Well, if, if somebody has one whisker, uh, that's not a beard. Okay, we'll add a second whisker. It's, uh, it's just a difference in degree. It's one more whisker. So that shouldn't make a difference in whether it's a, a beard or not. So if, if one whisker isn't a beard, then two whiskers isn't either. And you repeat that argument ad nauseum, just add one more, it's still not going to be a beard. And the, the absurd conclusion is then that once you get to however many risk whiskers you've actually got, Ibis, well, that can't be a beard either because it's just it's just a difference yeah, in degree from patches. that one whisker. I don't have a beard. <laughs> and yet it's pretty obvious to me that you've got a beard. And so the point is that there that differences in kind often are uh, do depend on just really big differences in degree. And what makes the difference is often going to be a, a question of context. And they're going to be borderline cases where uh, you know you just have to make a call uh, over where to draw the line, and and the line's not drawn for you. That again doesn't mean that it's arbitrary, because look, there's an observable difference between you know what you've got on your face and what Larry's got. Well, uh, and even though I bet I could find a few whiskers there somewhere, so uh, it's it's there's there's real difference there, and. Yeah, there's borderline cases. We'll have to make a call. We'll have to make a judgment. We'll have to draw a line. It's a human choice, but it's a human choice that's made on the basis of facts that are observable. There's really observable differences between a child that's born whose umbilical cord has been cut uh, and especially a big differences between them and a, and a newly conceived egg. But even still, big differences between the already born and the one that's in the womb. The biggest difference is it's not in the womb anymore. And that's a, that makes a big difference to the woman. As it often goes, um, your, you stated your position about rights and this whole individuation thing and the separation. Um, what about Siamese twins and their their bodily connection, especially in reference to the mother and birth and such? Siamese twins who are physically conjoined to each other don't have individual rights with respect to each other in the usual way. And for this very reason, that is to say, you can't say that the, the one Siamese twin has like the right to liberty uh, to move to California while his brother lives in New York, just like the rest of us do. And the reason they don't have that right is because they they're stuck to each other and they uh, they have to negotiate these things and come to an agreement. And they certainly are individual um, and individuated with respect to the rest of society. So nobody else has the right to kill them. Um, I think that's the primary way where the the idea of individual rights applies to the Siamese twins. They've got rights against the rest uh, the rest of us. We can't. I mean, they're individuated from us. Uh, they're not fully individuated from each other. But then that actually has implications for ways in which their rights are different. And if it were the case that the the fetus was somehow magically uh, able to inside the womb start thinking thoughts and communicating with us. And it's like, I'm, I'm trying to build a life in here and I've started a new project already. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to trade it with you when, once I'm born that we could maybe then start to talk about, you know, whether physical individuation was the real criteria, but of course that's not the case. And there's, there's, there's no project of happiness pursuit that's started yet, uh, in the case of the, of the, the fetus in the womb. Somebody uh, killing a child in the womb and treating it as a double homicide and the case of a mother taking maybe some strong drugs that may hurt the fetus and we're charging her on a crime. I believe what people bring these up is to bring out the best way to put it is how does your position on 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 abortion and fetal rights, I mean, and, and rights uh, extend to these cases? Would you be able to justify having these laws or not? So let's talk about, suppose we're talking about a, a woman is killed by a, a mugger or something, and she's pregnant and the, the fetus dies as well. Now, if the fetus, if she actually wanted to have the child, then there there is a a greater offense there. And that's that should be clear from the fact that if, if the attack happens and the mother survives, but not the fetus, She's still obviously been injured. I mean, she's she wanted to have that child, and this is this crime has taken this away from her. That's a greater amount of damage to her life 
uh, obviously, than if she if only she had died. I'm not sure if the way you would do this would be to say, legally speaking, as long as we know that she wanted it, then you'll charge the person with a greater crime. I don't know if you'd call it a double homicide or you'd call it a homicide with extra damage or something like that. And uh, the last case, I don't know if you addressed it there with the um, her doing drugs herself. If she wants the child and if she actually then has the child, but the child is injured or deformed or uh, you know otherwise harmed by the drugs the mother took, it sounds strange, but I think you know you could actually hold her legally responsible for that. Now, what that would entail, what form of holding her responsible that would that would mean, I think is unclear. And I think what's important there is the fact that well, if she engages, if she uses the illicit drugs and, and causes this damage, the aggrieved victim there is the child who is eventually born. If she doesn't have the abort, if she doesn't have the child, if she has an abortion instead such that she prevents the child from being born so that there's no one there to be damaged, I think that would cancel the crime. There wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a, uh, there wouldn't be a crime there. I mean, what do you, what do you have to say about like the, the pro-choicers who typically argue from the standpoint of, you know, personhood, like whether or not has personhood. And I think there are qualifiers of it kind of go into, well, it's not a conscious sentient being that can't have subjective experience. It's subjective. Um, experience. Yeah, they, they particularly say subjective experience, like own values, um, its own dreams and its own thoughts and so on and so forth. What, what do you say to those pro-choicers who use that as their, I guess, their primary weapon against pro-lifers? They're right that the fetus doesn't have any of those things. The way that this concept is used uh, is to say, if you have certain mental qualities and that's all, that's what generates special moral status and that's what generates rights. And there's all kinds of problems with that. It's not this kind of disembodied consciousness that has rights. It's a embodied consciousness embodied in an individual human being who's using that consciousness in order to survive and in a social context such that it needs the freedom to do it and we need the freedom from it. Um, so all those facts are important to it. And the kind of personhood language, I think, has too much of a disembodied view of rights, uh, disembodied view of uh, what kind of being it applies to. It wouldn't be obvious if there were ghosts that were rational, that they would have rights. <laughs> now, what would you say to the libertarians who would argue from the pro-choice uh, perspective, they essentially amount to, uh, well, when you're when you're pregnant, like the embryo or the, the you know, baby inside of you is initiating force against you and thus it forfeits its rights that way. And therefore, you're justified in having abortion. And sometimes this is called evictionism. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because we're, uh, we're departure. I know there's a flip side departureism, which is almost like whatever. It's, they're trespassing on your property and so you have the right to evict them now off sometimes the evict the evictionists will say you you have the right to evict them that doesn't mean you have the right to kill them and so you'd only have the right to kick them out of your body uh if we found some kind of uh star trek uh transporter machine uh but since we don't these libertarians will say you actually don't have the right to the abortion others will say won't make that distinction both of them are wrong. Well, first thing to say is it's not about property rights. It's 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 about the woman's right to her life, where that is understood in the way that objectivism understands the right to life, which is not simply the right to not be killed, but the right to engage in a process of self-sustaining action in the pursuit of happiness. And you've got the right to all of that. It doesn't even really make sense to talk about the body one's body as one's property i mean you can you can talk about it in a metaphorical way which which i think is fine but literally speaking it's not true like you didn't buy your um, body from anybody you didn't earn it you were born with it and it's part of what it's part of who you are it's not something that you have but then the other issue is that it's not the case that you you should think about the fetus as something that's initiating force or trespassing or anything like that because that takes for granted or at least is trying to be neutral about uh, the moral status of the fetus. And I, I think often the, these libertarians don't want to take a position on that. They want to say, well, let's suppose that it's a human being with rights. Well, even if it is, then it's initiating force. And so you can use force against it. But that's much too agnostic. We we know a lot of things about the fetus. And, we, and this is our previous discussion. There's some big differences between it uh, and a newborn child, even though it has human DNA, that's irrelevant to whether it has rights, whether it's an individual human being.